tell you, <laughs> it's a bit cr of a crazy and stressful time we're living in with the US presidential election. How are you coping with it all? What have you been doing? <laughs> uh, hey, Michaela, how are you? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've had one eye on the TV, like uh, everyone else. And the last I heard was um, that Biden looks like he might be in the running for the presidency and uh, <laughs> and the actual president is throwing around claims of fraud um, without any evidence. So this, this could be really interesting. But um, yeah, so one eye on that. And uh, of course, we've got our own um, you know, related issues with COVID. Um, so yeah, we've had some really good, good news today with seven days in a row of zero deaths and zero new cases. So we're well on our way to, uh, yeah, getting rid of some more restrictions, which would be really good. <laughs> Very exciting. Hopefully before Christmas, we'll see. Um, uh, yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you want to be a politician? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, so essentially, I kind of started a little bit later in life. I was 35 when I ran for election and I'd, I'd always been involved in, uh, you know, team sports and things like that. And um, I took on leadership roles as a firefighter. But uh, there was a couple of things around Frankston and uh, well, I thought Frankston had been neglected basically by state and federal governments. Um, but I also, I guess, thought, well, if, if, not now when and um if i'm not going to put my hand up how can i expect other people to so that's what kind of motivated me that was a catalyst there was a couple of uh catalysts going on but one uh at the time was what some of the things the current or that government at the time were doing um and yeah it's been a been a vertical learning curve ever since <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so you've been part of a government dealing with COVID 19 as mentioned before how stressful has that been? Yeah, uh, look, I'd be totally lying my pants off if I said it wasn't stressful. Um, I'm the parliamentary secretary or assistant minister for bushfire recovery. So we're, you know, while COVID's going on, there's a ton of other things we've got to do as well. Um, I'm also the parliamentary secretary for police and emergency services. So uh, I'm involved to a certain extent with how some of the COVID um, restrictions roll out and, and what we do. Uh, and, it, you know, it has been really stressful because um, it's a time that, you know, unprecedented is the word that everyone talks about, um, but certainly it's, it is unprecedented, but it's, it's something that we've never, or this generation has never had to experience something like that. And we've always been really lucky. We've always been really lucky. Like, um, you know, if I talk about my parents, they had interest rates on the house of like 18% or something. They had um, you know, Vietnam War and all that kind of stuff. Um, my grandparents had uh, the Depression. They had the Second World War. Um, before that, had Spanish flu. Um, you know, we've had our challenges, but we've been pretty lucky in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, to adjust to this kind of crisis with so many moving parts and, and then people saying that, you know, there aren't people dying and it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been very interesting, yeah. Yeah, it's all a bit crazy. <laughs> so we've seen now more than ever with coronavirus how how much politicians are often ridiculed and can be the focus of anger. Um, how do you deal with these type of days and weeks when you get ridiculed and have this anger put on you? Uh, I guess down in Frankston, we've always had a bit of a culture where it's attracted some pretty uh, underhanded tactics and types. Um, and, and I think Frankston has been a bit of a hotbed for it because of our ultra marginal seat status and bellwether status. So um, it's not really new to me. So I guess I've had a pretty, pretty thick skin for a long time, but um, if I could turn that question on its head and, and say the way I deal with it is by just talking and having conversations with good people and being, there's plenty of people in Frankston that inspire me. Um, that's kind of how I deal with it. And you don't need to look very far in Frankston to find um, groups of people that have got together and said, right, how do we help people that uh, are doing it really tough now? Um, and, you know, the, the list goes on. I'm not, I'm, for, for the sake of um, leaving someone out, I'm not going to mention everyone, but, uh, yeah, that's how I get through my days. And there's been some really, really um, long days. And 
uh, you know, you've got to take everyone's opinion on board, but I've got to admit, um, you know, when we're getting 800 emails a day um, from various people, uh, have I instructed my staff that if it starts with, um, there is no such thing as COVID, or, you know, if, it, if it's, um, you know, something a little bit uh, oddball, um, that just doesn't make sense. We we put um, the cares and, and priorities of people in Frankston as the focus. So if someone needs housing, if someone needs to flee family violence, if they've got um, some ideas about what we could be doing better, that's what we deal with and we keep it pretty positive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so has it been rewarding as part of the Andrews government to know that Victoria has had success with containing the virus? As you said, seven days. <laughs> Yeah, look, uh, it's it's been a long journey. Um, coming from that firefighter background and being involved in you know the Moore Mine Fire, um, uh, Black Saturday, and sitting through that Royal Commission on Black Saturday as well, uh, yeah, you know, I've got a fair idea in my mind that when when you're faced with a crisis this big uh, and you haven't ever faced it before, um, you know, some people I think think that everything should go 100% right. And it just doesn't happen that way. Um, there'll, there'll be lots of ideas, some good, some bad, and you know you've got to take them all into account. Um, but to to do to to hold that line and actually believe in science is something that I hold very dear. Whether it be about the environment and global warming and things like that, or all this, and I think this is an example of. Uh, you know, the science actually got us through this and, and listening to the health professionals, not the people who think they're health professionals. And the example we can take out of that too, Michaela, I think is that, uh, you know, the the flat earthers, the people that don't believe that the, the globe is changing, well, um, we, we teach our kids science in school. We listen to the science and it got us through COVID or is getting us through COVID. Um, how can we not listen to the science for environmental issues as well? Um, so there's... You know, it's it's rewarding to be on the other side of it, but uh, and but knowing, um, you know, a lot of people I think thought that that light at the end of the tunnel was a train coming to hit them, um, because they we've never seen this before. So, you know, it's we, we've seen a lot of people hold the faith in Frankston, and it's been rewarded. It's been really good, um, but it's yeah, you know, it's tough having phone calls from people every day who uh, think about how they're going to feed their families and. Um, they've lost their jobs to see people starting to get work again. A lot of appreciative people because I think people are now realising that when Ireland is now using our model, um, when the states just broke their own record for 100,000 new coronavirus cases today, uh, things could be much worse. Um, and you know, some people want to be focused on hotel inquiries and things like that. Um, and I think we should be looking at those things and learning from them. Um, but the thing is, I think we've done it right. I think we've, yeah. we've definitely listened to the science and done it right. Not saying that everything was done perfect, but um, there's already you know countries that are learning from what we did and doing that. Yeah, absolutely. As you said earlier, that we we trusted in the science and we listened to the science. It can be something that's frustrating for my generation to know that the government puts its faith in the science for this cause, but just won't listen to it for the environment when we're pleading for action. How can we get the government to actually recognize the science and do something about it and why how can the government subjectively choose what science they're gonna follow and listen to yeah it's a really good question um a lot of it doesn't come down though to um, what science you believe in what you don't it's how you can actually make that change and keep on making that change without um people who are scared of change um you know making sure it doesn't get voted through parliament and you know, for example, we've seen some some campaigns over the recent weeks. Uh, you know, one would be uh, a campaign that was run by the opposition that said some legislation we were going to put through Parliament meant that anyone could come into your house and arrest you and all this kind of stuff, and it it just wasn't true. And the same, to a large extent, is about it uh, is what's said about environmental issues. So, uh, say even yesterday, uh, the Andrews government announced that we are building. Um, the largest uh, Tesla battery uh, out, at, out near Geelong. And it's going to be twice as large as South Australia's. Um, when South Australia's built theirs, they had huge issues with the politics of it, saying it wasn't worth it, this, that and the other. Um, it's turned out it is. We're now building a, another one. What's come out today is um, some people have said, oh, it's, that's not even enough power to get through three episodes of the Kardashians. 
and you know they don't understand that this isn't this isn't a uh, its single purpose is to is to plug a gap, and I guess what I'm getting at is some of these issues are so complex that um, that wholesale message to um, other people in opposition or people that need to vote for it or even the community is really hard. Um, the the thing about the science is uh, from from where I'm sitting and where from uh, from a government perspective, I think we're all about the science. I think it's though encouraging other parties and other levels of government to actually get on board and help because whether it be the you know contained deposit schemes, whether it be the renewables or wind farms, we're leading the nation in this. And every bit of science says that this is the way to go, but we've still got people that say it's a waste of money. Yeah. As you mentioned, Victoria is introducing a container deposit scheme in 2023, which is super- Well done, Michaela. <laughs> your crew. <laughs> Why is this such an important thing and how is it likely to work? Good question. So, first of all, congratulations to yourself and the environment team because uh, you guys did a petition on that particular subject and amongst other people, but uh, that petition was actually seen by the Premier as well and the Environment Minister. Um, so it was, uh, it was a really good day when, when we announced that. Um, what we had to do prior to that was just get the, the recycling and uh, waste issue back in order. There were some issues there when China decided they wanted to go through a different policy. Um, it's important because it encourages people in a pecuniary sense to actually recycle. So drink your Coke, see the 10 cent stamp on there and go, well, if I had 10 Cokes this week, which I'm sure some people do, um, you know, I, I push that in the little ATM machine and it spits out, um, you know, some vouchers or some money. Um, it's interesting because it's working in New South Wales at the moment uh, and there's a there's a private contractor that takes care of all that and their data is showing it's really successful. Um, it's getting more uh, recyclables processed uh, and not going into hard waste, which is fantastic. Yeah, that is super fantastic. It's so exciting. Um, it is. <laughs> so what are some other things the Victorian government are doing to help the state become more sustainable? Well... Um, <laughs> how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly there's some, uh, there's some local issues that, that we're looking at, uh, things like, uh, local governments pushing, uh, for changes to our beach with marinas and things like that. And I, I'm the sort of person that thinks, you know, that that's the jewel in our crown in Frankston and, we need to make sure we look after it. We can't endanger it. So if we do anything like this, it's got to be bulletproof. Um, we, we've got to know that it's solid and it's not going to de destroy our environment. Um, as far as uh, you know, the renewable sector, we've got the um, the most renewables. Even the power from uh, wind farms is now running our tram systems. Uh, we're really changing that frame in in a large way. We've actually stopped. Um, native forest timber logging as well, which was a huge announcement last year. Um, of course, really, really difficult for people to get their heads around and really difficult for some families in that industry, of which I've got relatives in that industry, but um, in a lot of ways it was it was coming for a long time. Um, the shift away from uh, Hazelwood Power Station, which was interesting because people say, oh, you shut down Hazelwood Power Station. Um, we not going to take credit for that. Um, that was actually NG, who were a French company. They're divesting from anything coal related. And they said, yep, we're divesting from that as well. Um, so now we're trying to fill that void with uh, as much renewable energy as we can. We've got the solar homes program as well, which has uh, been pretty huge. It's been extended as well. Uh, we want as, as many solar panels on people's homes as possible. And the government actually um, makes it almost free for people to get solar panels on their homes because this is this is the future like um and as i said at the start of this um chat you know if if we don't do it who will yeah. um and if we don't do it now when um so it's there's a lot going on there's a lot behind the scenes too that um, we can hopefully announce fairly soon but definitely getting the rubbish and recycling um into uh, a space where we could actually do this in large volumes was a, a a big goal too which we've done yeah absolutely 
Um, so can I ask if you think the school climate strikes have been effective and what would you suggest is the best course of action for students of my generation in terms of getting government, state and federal to take real and genuine action on climate change? Uh, because many of us are discouraged by the lack of response we are seeing from those in power. So I think the school climate strike rallies were successful. Um, and I would not have held my children back from going to them. I think it's uh, it's incredibly important that people are educated enough to know that uh, the action they take now will benefit them in the future and, and their kids and generations to come. Uh, and, and that's from a real cutting edge kind of uh, politics we're talking to. So, a bunch of people there saying essentially if you don't listen to me you don't save our planet i will vote you out we'll vote someone in who can and i, I think that's really really powerful um and I, you you would have seen the premier on tv basically saying the same thing i would not have um stopped my children from going because it's so important that, that they know these things and i think we've come to a turning point i think you'll see more and more governments actually um, starting to take notice uh, at the moment, um, you know, being, being in state where I think we've done a lot, but there's still so much more we can do. And in, we'd probably like to see a lot more, um, you know, a lot more talk of how we can do, uh, be involved in the Paris Agreement. Of course, we've just seen the United States, the first country ever to pull out of it. Um, it's really sad. And it's it's we're seeing that conversation about um, the regression. You know, these people in federal parliament bringing in lumps of coal and and whatnot. In a couple of years, they're going to be seen for the idiots they are, uh, because the rest of the world is actually probably laughing at us now. Scotland actually make enough power from their wind turbines to export power, and here we are with um, surrounded by coastline and wind, uh, surrounded by sunshine. Uh, and tidal water, if we wanted to use that for hydro, um, and yet we're we're still sitting here saying, let's dig up the ground. We've got you know this lump of coal here. Yeah. Um, so yeah. as with it, it is, and as with every government, you know, there's different personalities, and I'm very progressive in my politics as far as the environment goes. There are going to be people in my um, government that aren't, um, just like the federal Liberal government. There will be people that are really progressive, and others that aren't, and um, you know, government relies on people internally, like myself, like Peter, um, to just keep on pushing, 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 because we're here to represent our, our, our community. What our community wants um, is said very, very clearly, and that is progressive environmental policies to make sure that um, we've still got a planet to live on in 50 years. Um, so why do you think it is important for people to engage with politics? So I think politicians have got a bad name for, for various reasons and, and people um, tend to get disinterested in politics because um, you know you'll hear um, all sorts of negative things on the news about individuals in politics there's a there's a a larger majority of people in state and federal governments um, and the oppositions that that do the right thing they're there for the right reasons and you probably never see them in the media and these are the people more than likely um, that uh, people like yourself can come and talk to. Um, I've totally, totally lost the question, Michaela. <laughs> Sorry, it's Why been a long day. Why do you think it is important for people to engage with politics? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, politicians and politics have got a bad name. People have disengaged. Um, there's been all this negative media. It's, it's essentially around one or two people doing the wrong thing. There's a There's a majority of... MPs, federal and state, that actually do the right thing. Uh, I do find it odd, though, that some people forget whether they're in local council, state government or federal government, um, and they're elected by the constituency, that their job is to represent their constituency. And sometimes they need a reminder. And that's where people like yourselves come in. It's really important to be engaged in that political process, because if you're not, you're not being heard. Uh, and quite often, um, you know, we can't have a politician knocking at your door every week saying, hey, have you got an issue this week? How can I help you? So it's the, it's the emails, it's the conversations, it's the phone calls, um, inviting even someone out for coffee. 
um, it doesn't have to be all formal. It can be things like that just to start uh, that conversation moving and therefore some action as well. Uh, like I said at the start of my answer to this question, some people are probably really, uh, I guess, well, a good way of saying it is probably that they've lost faith in, in certain political systems. And I totally understand that. That's the reason I actually got involved in politics because I thought, well, um, if I don't have faith in this person, the one person I actually trust to do the right thing um, is me. So what, why should I expect anyone else to do it? I'll put my hand up. And um, maybe that's something you can think about sometime, Michaela, <laughs> taking that next step from activist and campaigner um, to putting on a different set of shoes where, um, you know, you've actually got, you know, 45,000 people in Frankston to, to listen to and you sometimes have to make decisions and 49% of those people won't like it and you'll, they'll tell you, <laughs> but uh, you know, that, that's your job. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am 17 years of age. <laughs> I am definitely worried about what the future will bring in terms of environmental de degrada degradation um, and increasing temperatures and the impact it will have on me and my loved ones. What advice can you give to me? So um, obviously, like me, you trust the science and I saw some pretty revealing data um, yesterday about temperatures uh, rising and I, I still can't for the life of me understand how people can ignore it and just say it's a cycle and whatnot um there's it, it just doesn't make sense that argument doesn't make sense at all um i think we need to be putting as much pressure on, as possible on change makers mm -hmm. uh, and that is everyone from local councillors to state and federal mps um, to environmental groups uh, getting involved with them and to make sure that uh, the number one issue or one of the major issues uh, is the environment and that when you raise that what you're actually asking for is these actions need to be taken we're not just here to be heard we need action to be taken uh, as i said sometimes um, governing and politics can be a slow process but we don't have the time for this we've got to get moving and get as much renewables uh, as many renewable projects going as we can of course, it's a global issue too. Uh, we see some people shirking from their responsibilities, a uh, la like US coming out of the Paris Agreement. Um, and that, that's really sad. And I think it, even from a government perspective, it's up to the people that represent this country to be to be meeting as dipl in diplomatic relations with some other nations and saying, why? What? We're doing the heavy lifting here. You know, you're still burning a ton of coal. Why? How can we work that out? Absolutely. That's such an important and powerful message. So how do you define good leadership? Uh, good leadership? Well, I think the best way I can describe good leadership at the moment is probably Daniel Andrews. Um, so I guess I, I trained as a to be a leader for a long time in the fire brigade. And, you know, you're leading people to um, go into fires, go into some very hairy situations and um, you've got to be the person that actually, uh, well, the troops know that you would do it as well. And Daniel's done that very well. To stand up um, for 120 days and be grilled by some very partisan media at times um, who didn't seem to be part of the solution uh, was amazing leadership. To, to embrace an issue and say, um, you know, the buck stops with me. We'll have a Royal Commission um, because... I think that's where, where real leadership comes out. We, he, we hear the word heroes and leadership a lot, but in my opinion, you only see real he heroism and real leadership in a crisis because that's when these people who might not necessarily think they're great leaders or who might not necessarily think they're heroes actually step up to the plate and do a wonderful job. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it might be a bit kitchen. People might think, oh, well, Paul's a Labor politician. Of course, he's going to back in the Premier. Um, but I've seen some of the things behind the scenes um, and I've, I've been amazed at the resilience um, and the commitment to getting through this crisis. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, in, in years to come, I think there'll be books written about it. Um, maybe not now, but in years to come, I think there'll be books written about it, um, about, you know, leadership in a crisis and this being 
a very, very good example. Definitely. The resilience he showed was impeccable. Um, so what does Melbourne look like in 2030, in your opinion? Um, well, if we if we have our way uh, and we're in government for a, uh, another term, I think, uh, you know, there's so much more we can do. I know that uh, Melbourne City Council um, and a lot of the, the uh, regional or interface councils as well are on board with uh, what needs to change as far as uh, you know, new growth industries, um, renewable energy, um, managing the way we do things and changing our culture to accept that the way we've done things in the past hasn't been the best and it actually has led to more problems than, than solutions. Um, but I think in, you, you will recognise Melbourne. If we're talking about Melbourne, the city, you'll still recognise Melbourne, but uh, you know, you'll see pretty much mostly electric cars I think on the roads, um, which is good. You'll be seeing more charging points. They'll be the tangible things you see. Um, there'll be a lot uh, less electricity coming into the city from coal-fired power stations. Um, more of it will be renewables. You know, these um, the battery project we just spoke about, the Tesla battery project out at um, uh, near Geelong. Uh, it won't be long before that's seen such success that uh, there'll be more investment in that kind of thing as well. Um, you'll see, uh, I think you'll see like an ATM style machine here and there for container deposits. Um, and I think you'll probably see a lot more environment, environmentally aware people walking around, uh, people that know and grew up like yourself with, um, you know, good, I guess, good environmental leaders and good leaders in your school, um, like your teacher, uh, who, who want to instill the power in you guys to actually make that change. And I mean, we see we do see that already uh, around Melbourne. Um, yeah, the, the amount of electric cars we're seeing, um, we're seeing charging points already. Um, as I said before, the uh, renewable energy powered trams, things like that are, are really important, but it's only the start of that cultural change. It's, a, it's almost a generational change. Yeah, that it, sounds like it is. It, it's inspiring though to see it now because, um, I, I mean, from inside government to see that battery come out and how much hard work uh, was behind it, uh, and you know the pushback from certain areas in in politics, it is just amazing to see that that will be built next year. It's yeah. fantastic. It's what an exciting time to be alive. I can't wait for twenty thirty is the way you described it. <laughs> <laughs> So are you? Well, we'll have um, we'll probably have um, drone taxis too. Oh, how exciting! <laughs> I know they're, tr they're starting to trial them overseas. So yeah, yeah. I, I I think why not have a first if it's going to be done somewhere? Why not do it the first time in Victoria? Exactly. Why not? <laughs> so, are you friends with another politician from an opposing party? And if so, do you discuss politics? Uh, yes and yes. So. Um, when you become an elected member of parliament, you work on committees. So I chaired the family and community development committee and uh, we, we did a, a few investigations or a few inquiries. Um, and some of them are, you know, they're pretty heavy topics. One was um, uh, deaths in perinatal services. Another one was um, uh, autism services, another, inquiry we did which lasted a year was uh, abuse in elderly um, so you tend to you, you know you, you might fly to Mildura or you, some committees go uh, overseas and interstate to find out what some other place are doing so we can bring that back and do it if it's really good um, but in doing that you do form really good friendships with people and you know the one thing I know is that most people in politics and I say most there's a couple that I don't know why they're there but uh, most people in politics are there because they they want to help their community, and so you've got that common bond. Um, and to me, you know, even question time now, where you might yell across the chamber. Not that we've done much of that this year because of COVID, but it's almost theatrics because you'll have a coffee later. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, I mean, there's good people on all sides of politics, and I I found it really interesting um, when I first became the member for Frankston because I wasn't highly politicised. I was a Labor person, but I. I wasn't, you know, highly politicised, and 
I had people pretty much throwing insults my way because I was Labor and they were Liberal. And um, I'm sitting down with people and saying, look, the thing we've got in common is Frankston. Hmm. And if you love Frankston, I love Frankston, then we're on the same page. Don't worry about colours. Let's just do the what we can for Frankston. And um, I think that still carries through. We've got a new bunch of councillors coming in to Frankston in the next couple of weeks. And I'll just be saying, I don't care whether you're Greens, Labor or Liberal. It doesn't bother me. Um, let's just work together. Um, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you've still got to have that working relationship, but I would say I'm probably friends with some um, of the opposition in Victoria. Yeah. I, I hope they would say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always nice to know that you guys are harmonious, harmoniously working together. So <laughs> why does Daniel Andrews pre preference the North Face? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I, I actually, funnily enough, did actually pose that to the health minister the other day because he had a black jacket on. He had Kathmandu. I said, so what, what's happening here? Is the branding off or what are you doing? Um, look, I think it was just a, I think it was just a company jacket that is maybe Kath or the kids bought him. Um, and um, I think, you know, from a political and a, a campaigning perspective, um, most people I meet don't wear ties and a suit all day. And I think they can maybe even relate to someone who doesn't like to. I, I don't think Daniel likes to wear a tie every single day. Um, certainly, uh, if you go to Israel and some other countries, the politicians never wear ties. Um, yeah. And they'll always be in chinos and a shirt. So, uh, yeah, look, I, I kind of follow suit a little bit too. I, I find that I'd rather not wear a, a tie and, and whatnot. But I haven't quite got the North Face jacket yet. But... Um, yeah, it's become a bit of a become a bit of a thing. It's like get on the beers, <laughs> oh. which you shouldn't be doing because you're seventeen. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. Um, Good. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time, Paul. It was great getting to chat with you. No worries. Anytime, Michaela. 